Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jim Yao. And most of all, thanks to you for coming. Uh, it's been fun meeting a bunch of you here. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm actually local. You know? uh, so anyway, welcome. It's a little late, but hope you've been enjoying things. Got a chance to go outside a little bit. Um, I changed my title a little bit. I decided to try to be a little broader. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, so uh, you've been hearing uh, kind of all day about uh, different quantum aspects of, of uh, physics of electrons inside of crystals. Uh, and I'm going to try to take a, a little bit uh, different perspective on that, tell you about different aspects of it. Um, but uh, I've been, I'm sort of tasked with a, with a fairly, uh, let's say, the more abstract uh, area of, of this field. Uh, so uh, it's maybe uh, even harder to get across what, what some of the uh, speakers have been trying to get across earlier um, with amazing success. So I will try to mitigate the difficulty uh, with humor as much as possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, uh, all of us here are, are fascinated by quantum physics and uh, it's, uh, I don't think it could be said better quantum than by the so noted happy. physicist uh, <laughs> Sheldon. Yeah, I'm glad. It's like looking at the universe naked. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from the series. Um, so, um, quantum mechanics uh, really reveals something bizarre about uh, how uh, how the world works, um, the real world. Um, so, the, the previous uh, science talks uh, have covered a, a lot of uh, really fascinating phenomena going on inside of crystals, and they're mostly been phenomena that ha that is associated with. Uh, these things that you've been introduced to, which are called energy bands. Um, uh, and uh, I, I stole a few images from the previous talks that hopefully look familiar to you. Um, uh, these, uh, oh, oh yeah, I, I threw in an extra slide. Maybe I'll want to comment on that. Uh, just as a result of uh, questions and uh, chats I've had over the day so far, I uh, had a number of people asking about possible applications of these things. Um, and just I thought I'd throw one up that we've been somewhat interested in. Uh, it's uh, not precisely in topological insulators, but in kind of topological metallic uh, materials. Uh, you've heard that one of the uh, key signatures of these things are, uh, are uh, Hall effects. The Hall effect in general is something where uh, an electron uh, moves in a direction perpendicular to an applied force. Or uh, if you make an electron move, uh, a, uh, a field, like an electric field, or in some cases, a uh, uh, temperature gradient appears perpendicular to the direction the electron moves. Um, and there's an effect like this where uh, if you have a, a heat current uh, or a temperature gradient in a material, uh, a voltage, uh, so an electric field appears perpendicular to that. So that's kind of illustrated here. Um, this is uh, something that occurs in many topological materials. And this particular material, manganese, manganese 310, is kind of a topological uh, magnetic metal, even at room temperature, uh, it becomes one below about 420 Kelvin, so 100 some degrees above room temperature Celsius. Um, and it turns out that if you have a material like this, so this is actually a useful property, that it develops a voltage perpendicular to a temperature gradient, uh, you can make a, a very efficient arrangement of these materials uh, to recover uh, uh, heat in the form of electricity from, uh, energy in the form of electricity from waste heat. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Satoru Nakatsuji at University of Tokyo, actually is working on this as a technology uh, that could be used, for example, at uh, data centers uh, to, to recover power from uh, waste heat. Um, but so these phenomena that you've heard about, in particular uh, these uh, sort of Hall effects and, and bands uh, in systems in, in these interesting crystals, they rely on one particular aspect of quantum physics, uh, which is wave-particle duality. You know that electron is a particle. We think of it as a point-like thing. Uh, and yet, under many circumstances, it behaves like a wave. Uh, so you've, I'm sure, all heard of this famous thought experiment where you send, shoot electrons through a pair of slits. Uh, each electron has to go through one uh, slit or the other. But nevertheless, if you don't observe them uh, going through the uh, going through the, these slits, uh, they will start accumulating one at a time on the screen uh, behind, uh, as particles must. But you, you see how they accumulate. The, the pattern of the accumulation forms a, a wave interference pattern. So this is part of the wave uh, particle duality uh, aspect of quantum physics. 
Um, it played a role in Stranger Things. Uh, this uh, Planck's constant uh, played an interesting role in Stranger Things. Those of you who maybe followed that, uh, it's kind of amusing. I can tell you a story about that after if you want as well. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, we can kind of increase the scale a little bit and, and talk about electrons and atoms. Uh, you've already seen, uh, I think, very nicely in Silke's talk and also in Jen's earlier today. Uh, that uh, you can think of these bands in solids as being built up out of orbitals, and you guys, especially those of you who teach chemistry, you know, know the, have pictures in your head of these orbitals. Um, the orbitals are, again, a manifestation of kind of the wave-like nature of electrons. They're very similar to sort of interference patterns uh, that you get standing waves uh, of uh, waves of, of other materials uh, when they're uh, occurring in some confined geometry. Uh, for example, if you vibrate uh, sand on a, on a vibrating platform, it'll form these interesting uh, standing waves that just show the patterns of oscillation of the, uh, of the, the speaker that you're shaking them on. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, of course, very different from uh, planets in a solar system, even though, a, even though an atom is very much like a solar system with electrons replacing the planets and the nucleus replacing the sun, uh, but the difference is really quantum mechanics. Um, you know, this is, a, I think, a very striking image of wave-particle duality, uh, uh, two images. This is obviously real waves on the surface of water. Um, the right is a, a picture of electron waves uh, on the surface of metallic bismuth. Um, they're measured using a, a type of electron microscopy, and you can just see the striking similarity, um, uh, which is, again, an aspect of the wave-like nature of electrons uh, in solids, and it's because they are quantum particles. Um, uh, the difference between the two, probably the key difference is, you know, these, these waves are created by water droplets falling on, uh, on the water, like in a rainstorm, but if the rain stops, this thing quiets down. Uh, the surface of the metal never quiets down, and that's because the electrons are always moving due to their quantum motion, uh, uh, even at, at very low temperatures, and they move very fast, actually. Um, so, uh, wave particle duality, it's crucial to everything you've heard, but it's only one aspect of quantum physics. Okay, um, and in fact, it, it's a result, we can think of it as a result of uh, a more fundamental part of, of quantum physics, which is the principle of superposition. Okay, so, uh, you know, as high school teachers, uh, you, you have to teach a certain amount of math to teach physics. Some of you are math teachers, uh, even. Um, and so, you know, people start out in elementary school, they learn uh, how to add numbers. Okay, you know, 7 plus 5 is 15, if, is 13, if I didn't make a mistake, and apparently I did. <laughs> Uh, that's amusing. <laughs> that's a theorist for you, you know? Um, so a little later, you physics teachers learn, you teach how to add vectors. I guess probably everybody knows vector addition, okay? So now you're learning how to add objects that are not just numbers. You learn a rule, for example, the geometrical rule to lay two vectors end to end. Uh, first one at the, starting at the end of the second one. Um, and uh, then drawing the third vector, and that's the sum geometrically. You learn other rules to do it. So in, in quantum physics, we learn how to add uh, even more complicated things than, than vectors. We learn how to add states. So in, in, in quantum mechanics, every physical system uh, uh, can be represented. Its, uh, its condition is represented by something we call a state, and we tend to draw it in this abstract way with this, uh, these little uh, lines uh, uh, around the object. So famously in quantum mechanics, you know, uh, uh, Schrodinger pointed out you could think about the quantum state of a cat, and that cat might be alive, or the cat might be dead. Uh, but in quantum physics, we could add the states. Of any system, we're allowed to add the states, uh, add two states. So that's the principle of superposition. So that the cat could be alive and dead. Um, and also we can multiply these states by numbers, actually complex numbers. So a perfectly good state is uh, 0.5 times a cat being alive and 0.7i times a cat being dead, okay? Um, so uh, the wave-like nature of electrons can be thought of as a consequence of quantum superposition, okay? These standing waves, with some uh, higher s orbital in an atom, uh, can be thought of as just a superposition of, of the more classical states where an electron is here or an electron is here or an electron is here with different amplitudes in front of these things. Okay, so the waves are really just built up as superpositions uh, of other quantum states. It's inevitable that we have wave-particle duality once you know that we have the superposition principle. Okay, but the superposition principle applies, uh, implies more than just wave-particle duality. 
Basically, wave particle duality uh, is one of the consequences, probably the main consequence of the superposition principle when you have one particle. But if you have more than one particle, it are, there are other consequences that are uh, as interesting as wave particle duality. And the, the one that we like to talk about most of the time is, is entanglement. So that the, most of the subject of this talk is, is about entanglement um, in quantum systems. So um, uh, there's a, a very uh, nice platform uh, context to talk about entanglement, and that uh, that uh, we usually talk about it in terms of kind of the the most simple quantum systems we can imagine, which is which are uh, quantum bits. Uh, so you know classical computers, which uh, which I'm running this presentation on, for example, my uh, uh, my iPad. Uh, my iMac uh, runs on classical bits. Each bit inside this computer can take just two discrete values, zero or one. So a, a single quantum bit is something like this. We, we just promote the zero to the state of zero and the one to the state of one. But by the superposition principle, our quantum bit can be in any uh, linear combination of these two states where alpha and beta are complex numbers. Okay. Uh, so uh, one uh, classical bit uh, corresponds to one quantum bit or qubit, um, and that qubit uh, is described by two complex numbers. Okay. Um, and nature uh, provides us a, a qubit, and it's, it's just this object, the electron spin. You've heard the, the word spin quite a few times already uh, in previous talks. I'm not sure if everyone really knows what it is. Um, you can uh, conceptually think of an electron as a, a, as a little ball of charge that is actually spinning. Um, and uh, if it spins, uh, you know, a, a moving electric charge produces a, a current, and that produces a magnetic dipole. Uh, so you can think of an electron as, as being like a little, uh, little magnetic dipole, uh, but it has a quantum aspect to it, in particular that that quantum dipole really only has two fundamental states it can be in. That quantum dipole can point up with a specific value of its magnetic dipole moment, or it can point down. Um, and we, we like to signify that by arrows. So instead of drawing this complicated spinning little electron, uh, I'll draw an up arrow or a down arrow, which just indicates the direction uh, that it's spinning. Um, and so that, that, uh, that electron, like the qubit, um, it really is a, a quantum bit. Um, it, it can be in a superposition of up and down. So there's a subtlety. Uh, we often like to talk about uh, electron spin as also being like an arrow. Why did I make the, two, the arrow point either up or down? You could just as well have the arrow pointing, let's say, to the right. Uh, uh, the, the quantum aspect is that, that actually the state, that's a perfectly good state, the arrow could point to the right, but that is actually a superposition of the up and down state. Okay. Uh, so any uh, orientation of that arrow is, can be rewritten as a sum of these two other quantum states. That's the weird nature of this fundamental uh, electron spin of quantum bit. Um, so, uh, in the materials you've been hearing about, uh, the electrons have been mostly moving around the crystal a lot. Uh, in Silka's talk, some of the electrons, the ones on the cerium atoms, almost didn't move. They were kind of almost stuck to their cerium atoms. Um, if, you, if you take that one step further, there's a whole set of materials in which electrons really don't move. Okay? Uh, they really stick to their atoms. We don't have to worry about their motion at all anymore, uh, but we still have to worry about their spin. Um, so uh, these are actually uh, very common. There are thousands of insulating magnetic materials which have spins doing whatever they feel like doing inside the crystal. Uh, so the most familiar thing that you actually observe them doing in, in the you know, macroscopic world is, is uh, in ferromagnets. And that happens when the spins all align and their dipole moments all add and they produce macroscopic dipole moments like a bar magnet. Um, Actually, it turns out that uh, that's uh, relatively uncommon, uh, even though you know, ferromagnets have been known since for several thousand years. The ancient Greeks, ancient Chinese all knew about ferromagnets. Okay. Um, but it turns out they're the vast minority. Probably a thousand times more materials are antiferromagnets than ferromagnets. In antiferromagnets, the spins also uh, adopt some kind of ordered pattern, but in, in such a way that the net magnetic moment cancels out. So this is a simple example where half the spins point up and half the spins point down. You can't see this macroscopically, and so for thousands of years we didn't even know they existed. Um, it was only really around the 1950s that antiferromagnets were proven to exist. 
uh, because of the development of the technique of neutron scattering. People, you needed a nuclear reactor to produce neutrons. Those neutrons are shot into a material, uh, and you measure how they bounce off the material. Uh, and by detecting the pattern of, uh, of those scattered neutrons, uh, you can actually uh, measure these uh, antiferromagnetic patterns. And that, this was used as a, a way to prove, and it's now uh, the existence of antiferromagnets, and it's a very, very powerful technique to study magnetic materials. Um, so uh, let's get back to our spins, okay? Um, I said that uh, this aspect of entanglement emerges when we have uh, more than one particle. So let's just consider two particles. So it's very standard to consider uh, two spins, uh, one uh, uh, the property of Alice and one the property of Bob. This is Alice from uh, Alice in Wonderland and Bob the Builder in case you don't recognize. Okay. Uh, so Alice and Bob can have spins in different states. So Alice's spin could be up and Bob's spin could be down, or Alice's spin could be uh, Alice's spin could be down and Bob's could be up. Things get interesting if we add those two states, which we're always allowed to do in quantum mechanics. That's a superposition state. This is the simplest entangled state. Um, uh, what does it mean that it's entangled? Well. Uh, if you ask on average, what do we know about Alice's spin, you would have to say nothing. It's equally likely to be up or down. And the same thing for Bob's. Uh, however, what we do know is that their spins are very correlated. Uh, if, if Alice's spin is up, Bob's is down. It's always opposite. Um, it means that if someone were to do a measurement on, if Alice were to measure her spin, uh, learn that it's up, then even before Bob does his measurement, we could predict that his spin will be down. Okay. And this has nothing to do with where Alice and Bob are. So Alice and Bob can prepare their spins together because they know that they're opposite. They're entangled like this. And then uh, Bob travels to Africa and Alice to South America. Uh, and then they do their measurement. Alice measures her spin, determines that it's up. Bob measures his spin. Uh, he determines that it's down. They meet again and uh, surprise, surprise, they'll learn that their spins are opposite. So, um, so this is a kind of strange uh, phenomena uh, that uh, performing a measurement in one place affects uh, or correlates with the outcome of a measurement somewhere else. Uh, this is called entanglement. Uh, Einstein famously didn't like it. Um, so uh, what it means is kind of interesting that this state, this entangled state in which the spin is uh, written it here, it's a sum of these two, uh, two different uh, quantum, simple quantum states. Uh, this state has information in it. So it's not a completely random state. We know that they're, they're, the two uh, person spins uh, are always anti-parallel. But you can ask, where is this information stored physically? You know, when I store information on my computer, I know where it is. It's sitting in my hard drive here, okay, or actually my uh, solid state drive. Um, uh, these two uh, people, Alice and Bob, they, they have, stored some information, but where is it? Uh, uh, it's hard to say where that information is. In fact, it's, it's distributed uh, in all space. Um, it, it's not local. Uh, and uh, so this is a weird aspect of quantum mechanics that uh, the information on the state of particles doesn't actually reside in the position of those particles. Um, so this is called quantum non-locality. Uh, and Einstein didn't like it. I'm sure you've heard this phrase, Spukhoft of Thernwerkel perhaps not in that language, uh, uh, which usually translated as a spooky action at a distance. Uh, my uh, German colleague probably is laughing a lot at my terrible accent. Um, uh, and uh, this is a, you know, a very bizarre uh, feature of quantum mechanics, but it's real. Um, it's so real that actually people, there are a class of uh, physicists doing uh, fundamental research into gravity uh, that actually believe that this type of entanglement uh, may be the same thing as the formation of a wormhole in space-time connecting the two people. But, you know, that's, uh, that's dreaming. Let's talk about reality. Okay. Entanglement of two spins is reality. Um, so the, the existence of superposition and entanglement have really important implications for information. So let's ask ourselves, uh, how much information uh, can we, uh, is associated with the state of uh, some number of quantum bits? Okay, so I already told you that one quantum bit is described by two complex numbers. Uh, what about two quantum bits? 
Well, uh, again, by the principle of superposition, uh, we can put each, uh, we can obviously imagine each spin to be either up or down. That gives four possibilities. And we can build an arbitrary superposition of those states, uh, each one with a complex number. So the state of two quantum bits is described actually by four complex numbers. If I have three quantum bits, uh, I can make uh, eight different arrangements of uh, up and down spins. And so it's described by eight quantum numbers, uh, complex numbers. In general, if I have n quantum bits, it's described by two to the n complex numbers. That's, and a complex number is, is, is not itself even really a finite number of bits. Depends how accurately you could measure it. Uh, but it's a huge amount of data to describe uh, the quantum state of even a relatively small number of spins. So uh, the state of n qubits or n spins stores two to the n complex numbers in its state. Um, so, you know, we're, as, as humans, we're not very good with exponentials. Two to the n is an exponential, uh, but as high school teachers, you, you know that exponentials grow very fast. So my, uh, my Mac here, it's, it's a, you know, reasonably good one. It has uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. Uh, if you work it out, that's about 10 to the 11 bits. Um, you can ask, how many quantum bits do I need to get that many numbers? Uh, well, uh, these complex numbers that specify the state of n uh, quantum bits, actually, if I have only 37 quantum bits, um, that's I've drawn them here, okay? Uh, that's how many complex numbers I need to describe the state of 37 quantum bits. Actually, more. This is more than the memory in my Mac. Um, physically, that, that's a, a little cube uh, of maybe half a nanometer uh, of this uh, antiferromagnetic material uh, uh, that I, I showed before. Um, and it scales pretty fast. If you had 500 qubits, there would be more complex numbers describing that state than there are atoms in the universe. Okay. Um, so uh, this kind of massive amount of information that is nature is manipulating in quantum states uh, is something that people are trying to use, and that's the basis of uh, quantum computing. Um, you may not be aware, we talked a, a bit about quantum industry, but uh, we have quite a bit of it in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, you might want to take a look at the Google Quantum AI website. That's Google's uh, quantum computing lab. It's, it's about two and a half miles away from us here. It's down the direction there. Uh, you can look at some pictures on their site showing there's a quantum computer right in there. Um, they have uh, running quantum computers. They're, they're kind of lousy quantum computers, but they run. Uh, and they, uh, they, process, uh, uh, they process information in computers of, that contain about 50 quantum bits. Okay. So it's, it's more, you know, more numbers than in my, uh, in my MacBook, anyway. Um, and uh, this is becoming a huge thing. Uh, Silke was talking about this. I mean, you can look online, you can find a list of, you know, on the order of 100 top quantum companies uh, around the world. Um, many of them, a large number of them, are, are doing similar things to Google, trying to control, uh, let's say, of order 100 quantum bits. Okay. And they're really trying to do what the kind of thing we do in computing. They're trying to control uh, in a very detailed way uh, what's going on with, with all these 100 quantum bits. Okay. Um, so our interest here is in uh, the natural quantum bits, the spins inside of a material. Um, and uh, we can ask, you know, what kind of entanglement occurs there? Um, so for, first of all, uh, I want to say that uh, entanglement of, of electron spins is not at all uncommon in nature. Um, in fact, it's, you can think really that uh, any chemical bond uh, is, a, uh, is like an entangled pair of electrons. Um, the classic example is something that was thought about by Linus Pauling, which is the uh, electronic state of, of benzene. Uh, it can be thought of as a quantum superposition of uh, bonding between, so these little, uh, this little ellipse here is meant to indicate uh, an entangled pair of electron spins. Um, and uh, uh, he pointed out that you can think about the electronic state of benzene uh, as, a, as a linear combination, a superposition of uh, these two different ways to form chemical bonds uh, uh, between pairs of the carbon atoms uh, in a, in a uh, six-member carbon ring. Um, so that's at a molecule level. What about in a solid? Uh, so as uh, Quan and Jen and others were telling you, you know, a solid has not 50, not 100 electrons in it. 
uh, even a millimeter-sized cube of solid has 10 to the 20 electrons in it. Okay. Um, so, you know, we already talked about how many numbers we need to describe the quantum state of just 500 electrons. It's, uh, you know, impossible for a human to comprehend, as, as Pawn mentioned, uh, even a number like 10 to the 20. Imagine how hard it is to comprehend 2 to the 10 to the 20, uh, which is how many numbers uh, would be involved in describing the state of a lot of spins. Um, it's less obvious that electrons that are kind of far away in solids uh, are entangled, uh, and it's a, an interesting subject, and that's kind of what I'll talk about for the rest of this time, um, uh, to try to understand what the electrons, uh, what happens when electrons entangle on a large scale inside a solid. When did I start, by the way? <laughs> All right, well. You started at 3.30. Really? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going too slow. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, unlike the people uh, at Google who tra really try to control every single one of their quantum bits, there's no way we're going to control 10 to the 20 quantum bits inside a solid. So instead, we, we have to ask a question, uh, what sorts of entanglement uh, can we create inside of a solid um, with a very large number of bits, and uh, what kind of phenomena do they lead to? Um, uh, just to connect a little bit to the subject of, uh, that you've heard about in the previous talks and what will be central to the conference in the following week, uh, this idea of topology. Um, uh, here's a, a kind of cartoon in which we've, I've, I've considered a bunch of electrons that are sitting on a lattice, and I'm, I'm pairing these electrons into EPR pairs, into singlet pairs. And again, according to the principle of superposition, we can add up different pairings of these singlets. And I've animated this as a little movie. Um, and if you look at this, uh, this movie, uh, you can see, okay, which, which electrons are forming singlet with which, which, which other, with which other electron is varying over time. Uh, but certain properties are preserved. Uh, that is something which we could consider as a topological invariant. Uh, in this picture, what you notice if you stare long enough, uh, is that no matter how you rearrange these, uh, these pairings of electrons, the, the number of these bonds or singlets, uh, EPR pairs that cross this black line uh, always remains the same parity. Uh, I guess I've drawn it so that it's always odd. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three. If we took a larger picture, it would change to five sometimes, uh, but it'll always be odd. Uh, it's an example of a topological invariant, um, just like uh, this very abstract object, the churn number uh, that uh, Juan was talking about earlier this morning. So we can use topology to try and understand these patterns of entanglement. Uh, so this, uh, this conference is about a quantum universe, and so we can ask, take it a little bit literally, I'll try to take it a little bit literally in the rest of this talk, and ask what kind of phenomena in the universe could occur inside of our crystal. Um, and really, we, we sort of think this way as theoretical physicists. Uh, could inside the crystal we find new types of particles, new forces, maybe we could even use the quantum physics inside the crystal to try and understand the forces and particles in our real world. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you a little movie, uh, which is uh, explaining uh, a pattern of entanglement in a, in a two-dimensional uh, magnetic system, antiferromagnetic system. Uh, it's from a beautiful set of videos. I'd highly recommend taking a look at this. This is made uh, by Julien Bobroff in, in France. In, uh, in Paris, uh, there's a really amazing set of videos. You should take a look. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite, quite striking. They're doing really amazing outreach efforts. Uh, and what this video shows you is that uh, this pattern of uh, entanglement, uh, superposition of many, many electron spin states can actually give rise to a, one phenomena which we find very interesting as physicists, which is something we call fractionalization. Do you know that elementary particles have certain properties? So the electron, for example, has a certain charge, the charge we usually call it E, and it has a spin, this, this minimal spin, uh, usually called spin a half. Um, and if you take, you know, 11 electrons, uh, you can build uh, various different spins, but you will always have charge. Um, and in fact, there's no combination of elementary particles that you can put together uh, that is charge neutral and carries a spin one half, the same spin as an electron. Um, but inside the solid, it can actually behave this way. Uh, that's an example of fractionalization. So let me show you this video. 
I'm only showing you part of the video. So now you're seeing the spins fluctuate. They're going, again, by animation, you're using animation to show superposition. So this is a little bit more quantum image now. That's the, that's this EPR pair. And now we have a whole lattice of EPR pairs, and we can superimpose different pairings of these electron spins. If we really look at it on average, I guess the volume's kind of high. Um, oops. If we really look at it on average, it's, it's kind of uniform. Now suppose we break one of these bonds. Instead of the spins being anti-parallel, we make them parallel. We can actually do this with a neutron. Then these, the, the bonds can actually rearrange and allows this freed spin to separate, separately move. Um, that thing behaves like a particle with the spin of the original electron, but with no charge, completely neutral. Something called a spin-on. Yeah, it's an amazing video, I'm very jealous. But uh, you should really look at this website. It's got amazing explanations, not only of very exotic things like this, but of a basic quantum phenomena. Um, so that's an example. This example of fractionalization is, is something that is uh, inherent to these very interesting uh, high, highly superimposed quantum states, uh, something we call the quantum spin liquid. Now, what might it be useful for? To be honest, we don't know. Um, uh, but we know, for example, that we know this basic property that inside this uh, strange material, there are, it, it behaves as though there are particles that are neutral and, uh, and carry spin. And these spin-carrying particles, these spin-ons, could also carry heat. So uh, they could move around as well as electrons in a metal, in which case it would behave like a conductor for heat, but not for charge because they're neutral. So this might be a way to create, for example, electrically insulating materials that conduct like metals. Maybe we'll be using uh, uh, cooking pans that are really made of stone. Some of you may have used them. I use them occasionally. But I use them exactly because they're very lousy heat conductors. Uh, uh, more practically, uh, one can imagine making insulating magnetic field sensors, various types of computing elements. I showed you thermoelectric applications. Um, we can go beyond. Uh, we can ask uh, about other types of forces and particles that might occur inside our crystal. Um, you know, one of the uh, earliest understood forces uh, of nature is the Coulomb force, uh, pretty much like gravity, except it can occur both attractively and repulsively. It's the force between electrons or between electrons and protons discovered by Coulomb in the 18th century. Uh, what Maxwell discovered uh, more than 100 years ago now, but not so much more, uh, was that uh, electromagnetism also gives rise to waves, propagating waves, which are light. Uh, and these are combinations of, uh, of propagating electric and magnetic fields. Einstein figured out that there was wave-particle duality. He learned that even though Maxwell described light as waves, it also behaves uh, under certain circumstances as particles. These are the photons. Um, but what none of these guys did was to tell us where light comes from. Okay? And in fact, nobody knows where light comes from. Okay? Um, uh, and I don't know where light comes from either, okay, I'm not, not saying that. But, but what we do, do know, what we have learned in studying these quantum entangled spin systems in is a way in which light could emerge. Uh, and in fact, we believe it, it even probably does emerge inside certain solids, different types of highly entangled quantum spin states. So this is a subject that uh, I was very interested in about 10 years ago. These are materials that are known as quantum spin ices. They have a particular chemical formula. This is a a crystal grown in a lab of, of one of these materials. Uh, they have a nice structure, which is, uh, here's a little plastic model of it. Maybe it's easier to, to see here. Uh, these electrons uh, that have uh, kind of localized spins, they reside on the corners of tetrahedra that are connected by, uh, by their corners. So this is, forms a lattice, which is called the pyrochlor lattice. And there are fairly strong local forces between these spins that uh, align them in such a way that the spins on one tetrahedron like to orient in such a way that two of the spins point in and two of the spins point out. That's called the two in, two out rule. But otherwise, there are many configurations that satisfy that rule. And so quantum mechanics allows these configurations to be superimposed. 
In this particular case, it turns out that we can represent these configurations in a different way, which, is, uh, which gives a little intuition. Um, in particular, I can try just connecting these arrows by lines. Uh, and if I do that, uh, since every tetrahedron has the same number of uh, arrows pointing in as out, the arrow, these lines will never end. They pass through the tetrahedron and they form uh, a set of uh, uh, lines without ends. They can form loops, basically, or they can span the entire crystal. Um, in that way, they're actually just like lines of magnetic field. You probably learned that magnetic field lines don't end. And that's because there are no magnetic monopoles in our world. It's one of the, one of Maxwell's equations. Okay. Uh, and, uh, the fact that these lines don't end is another sort of example of topology. It's something that is robust under deformations. Our quantum system can be in a superposition of different, uh, spin configurations, which maps onto a, it's the same in this line picture as different uh, arrangements of these lines passing through the crystal. So uh, over here you can see a, a line kind of snaking through like this, whereas here it's reconnected uh, to snake through back in this direction. And correspondingly, this line is reconnected to go out here. Um, but there would be, you know, of order 2 to the 10 to the 20 such arrangements of these lines going on inside this very complicated crystal. So uh, you have to take it as a point of faith that uh, this superposition of many, many of these uh, fictitious lines can actually behave like vacuum fluctuations of magnetic field lines in the real world. Uh, and so uh, these are a couple of my students who were in the group at the time we were working on, on this stuff. Uh, what they were able to show is that, indeed, under the right circumstances, these uh, magnetic pyrocore materials, quantum spin ice materials, would spontaneously behave inside the crystal as though uh, there were a new form of electromagnetism, as though it possessed a propagating photon, propagating light wave, and uh, uh, Coulomb char forces between charges. Um, now, I should tell you this has not been proven in the lab, but there's a big effort uh, in many labs to try to verify it. Um, I'm going a little over, but I, I just can't resist saying a couple more words. We talked about trying to describe, uh, recreate fundamental forces inside a crystal. Uh, the one that should pop into your mind is gravity, okay? Uh, could we have gravity inside a crystal? Could we have black hole, a black hole inside a crystal? So, you know, on the face of it, uh, these things are very, very different. Electrons and black holes couldn't be more different. Electron is one of the tiniest things we know. It's, it's the, you know, it's, it's the lightest, very common particle uh, that makes up matter. Uh, whereas the black holes that we actually know in nature are about the most massive things we know in, in nature. You know, we've learned about the black holes that were colliding, discovered colliding in the LIGO experiments, for example. Uh, and there's one at the center of our galaxy. Um, but I discovered a connection after much careful research. So the mass of an electron is uh, uh, some very tiny fraction of a kilogram, and the mass of the uh, black holes that were uh, measured colliding in the LIGO experiment were some very large number of kilograms. And these are these are real numbers. Observe. <laughs> <laughs> so that cannot be coincidence. There has to be a deep connection between electrons and black holes. Um, and actually, such a connection was postulated right here at the KITP, uh, not quite 10 years ago, I guess about, about eight years ago now, um, by uh, Alexei Kataev, who's a kind of a towering figure in our field, um, a theorist who's uh, at Caltech. Um, he came and gave a, uh, gave a, a very uh, exciting set of uh, two lectures um, here at KITP, where he uh, described how uh, a particular uh, theoretical model for what I would call a quantum dot. It's a very small, uh, very small crystal containing uh, a bunch of electrons that are confined and strongly interacting with one another uh, would actually recreate the physics of, uh, of uh, a quantum theory of gravity. Now, not in our uh, real world, but gravity in a particular two-dimensional space-time called anti-de Sitter space with a black hole at the center of it. Um, and uh, uh, this story continues. Last year, there was an interesting paper publishing a quantum simulation, actually on one of Google's quantum computers, uh, of uh, Alexei Kataev's uh, model black hole on a, on a quantum simulator. Um, I should say this, I view this as a bit far-fetched. Uh, that quantum simulation contained, I believe, nine quantum bits, so it's probably not much of a black hole, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, 
Uh, this is something that is viewed as possible by the theoretical physics community. So uh, I think I took enough of your time. I just want to thank uh, all, many of my close collaborators. I'm sure I've forgotten many here and students over the years who've been involved in this type of work. Uh, and then finish uh, with a, a slide that uh, harkens back to the, uh, the title of the conference. Um, we're all made of uh, atoms, and atoms are made of protons and electrons, and you've all learned that electrons are magnets. So we, are, we may be made of star stuff, but we're all made of magnets, actually. <laughs> so, thank you. Great, Leon. Questions? So I have a very basic question, but when you mentioned the spin-ons, Yes. Where did the electric charge go? Well, the, elec the, the electron is not moving. None of the okay. electrons are moving. What's really happening is that a, a pair of nearby electrons are in a coordinated way uh, exchanging their spin. We call this exchange. Okay. Uh, but the electrons aren't moving, so that's why there's no motion of charge. Throughout that movie, uh, every, every atom is occupied by one electron. I thought you said that it acted like a, an uncharged. Yes, electron. so the electron doesn't move, but the spin does move. Okay. Okay, so that's why it acts like an uncharged uh, particle. Okay, yeah. all right, thank yeah. you. Great question, thank you. So you've talked about moving spin a couple times throughout, and moving charges causes like electricity. What does moving spin result in? Uh, great question. So. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> so there are a couple of answers to this question. So the most practical question is it, it definitely results in moving heat, okay? Uh, so I think that the, the near-term uh, sense in which this is important for applications is that, that all these things are a way to transport heat. Uh, and uh, actually, transport of heat and energy is very important inside all sorts of technologies. Uh, but uh, uh, Jen, at least, uh, and maybe Silke, I forget, mentioned spintronics. Um, so this is a, there's a, a developing area in which uh, people try to use spin uh, uh, and transport it the way we transport electrical currents inside of solids. Um, so they are, spin is a form of angular momentum. So as physics teachers, you guys are very familiar with angular momentum. We can transport angular momentum using spin. So it, uh, one of the applications, for example, is to use uh, currents. Currently, there are, yeah, using current too much, but currently we are actually using, uh, in, in certain technologies, we use spin polarized electron currents uh, to manipulate the state of uh, small magnets. Um, and that's, that's used as a means of uh, flipping magnetic bits, um, which are, they're used currently for long-term storage of information, not things we want to manipulate very quickly. Um, but one could, in principle, do this with electrically neutral currents of spin. That's one of the subjects of spintronics, is to try and use this spin degree of freedom of the electron uh, as another way to store even classical information, not necessarily quantum information. And the current of those spins would be the thing you would, just like we use electrical current to transport charge from one place to another, uh, this current of spins would transport spin or angular momentum from one place to another. Does that answer your question? Sure. Sorry, I'm still trying to formulate that question in my head, but from what you said that it's, so you are transferring heat, you said, with the spin. Mm -hmm. Do the classical definitions of thermodynamics also apply here? So then when we say... Uh, yeah, great question. Um, uh, well, the answer is yes or no. Yes or no. Um, the, the applications that for heat transport are usually to larger systems. When you have a, a large enough uh, collection of quantum particles, they, they, they tend to behave on long scales more classically. Uh, so uh, in the same way we use, we can, we can think about electronics in a computer using Ohm's law and things like that. We can use similar description for heat currents, um, and that's fine. Uh, but in very small devices, we have to revisit uh, thermodynamics, and not just for spin. Uh, so there is a field called quantum thermodynamics, uh, which studies 
how do the kind of macroscopic laws of thermodynamics uh, apply or not apply to very small quantum systems? And that's, it's, a, it's a rich subject. Um, it's, there are very interesting questions about the, the meaning of entropy, for example, in, in very small quantum systems. And that's, it's connected to the study of quantum information. Uh, so uh, there's no simple answer to your question other than that, uh, yeah, uh, for large enough systems we can apply it. For small systems we have to rethink sometimes. So could entanglement be used for some type of communication? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this talk kind of evolved out of a talk that I, I gave as a public lecture, but that was you know, on the order of eight or nine years ago. At that time, there were no quantum computing companies, but there were already quantum information companies. Uh, so the simplest application of quantum entanglement uh, is exactly for communication. Uh, and it only requires, unlike these computers, it only requires entanglement of two bits. Um, and uh, so uh, it can be used, as you might imagine, to kind of send a signal somewhere, share information among two parties, and it can be used in a way to create uh, basically un, uh, unintercepted signals. Uh, so, you know, if you're a company or a government that has sensitive information it wants to transport, uh, uh, you're always worried about a third party spying on you. Um, so there's a, a field called quantum communication, uh, which relies usually on entangled photons, not electrons, because they're easier to send in long distances, uh, to do that in such a way that the, the rules of quantum mechanics, the fact that measuring something uh, affects the system, uh, uh, to, make, uh, to make a coded signal un, unintercepted, even in principle. Um, so, and Thank there are you. companies doing this. There are probably half a dozen companies at least uh, that have this type of technology. And for the foundations of that, we have the last novel class. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So the, the whole community uh, and, and the set of pioneering researchers, including Zeilinger, who were trying to develop protocols to be absolutely certain that uh, there was no way to avoid, yeah, that Einstein was wrong, basically, <laughs> that there was no way to avoid quantum mechanics. Uh, It's still spooky. <laughs> well, he got a Nobel Prize. I find it spooky. You had a question. Could you uh, expand on your statement that no one knows the origin of light? Uh, can I expand on a statement? Yeah. Um, so what? What? Uh, you know, we have a amazing achievement in uh, in the field of high energy physics is a standard model. It is a, a model which uh, provides a, a relatively small uh, you know, equation, if you like, that describes three out of the four fundamental forces. We can write it down. Okay. It actually has quite a few parameters in it that are needed to, you know, you, you vary them in order to fix the proton mass, et cetera. Um, uh, and that model describes uh, electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force. Okay. Um, However, we don't know where it comes from. Why is that the right model? Uh, actually, there, there are other models that would lead to the same observable predictions. We don't really know where it comes from. Um, so uh, the ultimate goal of, of a fundamental physicist, which I am not, okay, but we have some in the building, um, would be to know where it comes from. Uh, uh, we sort of, in, in condensed matter physics, we ask the, the opposite question. We know what the laws are governing the electrons and the atoms in our solid. Uh, we want to know what physics emerges from it. Um, we might ask the question in reverse. We kind of know the laws that uh, describe 
uh, electrons and photons and things in the world around us, could we figure out where they emerged from? That question is not really answered. Um, that's, that's what I mean. Okay. However, in this, uh, we know a way that it could happen. <laughs> if we all lived inside this particular crystal, uh, we were little people in there, we would see electromagnetism. Uh, and it's pretty much like the electromagnetism in our world. Uh, from the outside, we actually know where it comes from. I'm not sure if I understood the conversation that happened over there completely, but what I heard was that we can transfer information faster than the speed of light through entanglement. Was that what I not, understood or not? Not really. Uh, no, we, we can, uh, it's a little subtle, and I'm not sure I even understand all the, uh, exactly the right way to say it. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, at least within the theory of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, which doesn't describe everything, but we believe everything is quantum, um, then uh, the, the state of a quantum system, which is not a local object, is affected everywhere by a measurement in one place, instantaneously. Okay, that's the sense in which something happens faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. But we also know that within that very same theory, it's not possible to transmit a signal faster than the speed of light, even using quantum entanglement. Okay. Yeah. How do you simply entangle two electrons? Could you, could we do it in the classroom? <laughs> <laughs> God, we want a that's demo. A, Leon. That's a great question. I'm a theorist. I don't know. I just write it down. It's not it's not that hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, the thing which is done more commonly, uh, which might be I don't know whether it's possible to do it in a classroom, but I mean, there are sources that produce entangled photons. Um, you know, certain, uh, certain transitions uh, can release a pair of photons that are intrinsically entangled. Um, we used to have a guy in the department who worked on those things. Um, I don't think they're so uncommon. Uh, you may, maybe can buy off the shelf components to do this now. Um, how would you know? <laughs> It's harder. You have to do, you, you'd have to do, you know, various interference measurements, and these are not easy. Uh, uh, I don't know, it's a good, good question, but you really have to ask a, an experimentalist, not, not me. Um, like I said, they're entangled pairs of electrons. They're not uncommon. They're probably in you, they're in, in, in most matter, uh, but how do you know? Uh, how do you do a kind of a test of that entanglement? That's harder. Um, I should say, I mean, it's a, maybe it's, it'll sound like a little bit of a philosophical comment, but entanglement is not uncommon. It's everywhere. Um, what is uncommon is kind of controlled entanglement that we can, uh, that we can really measure easily um, and manipulate. This isn't really a question. This is more of a well, statement. I'm not really giving answers. No. Well, this is, it's more of a statement of that. Uh -huh. At the end of the school year, I always have like a Google me. You Ask me anything. Let's see, how, let's see if I can answer your question. Yeah. And a few years ago, somebody asked me, well, then what is love? And that was my answer. <laughs> huh? I got, yeah. <laughs> I was like, who knows? Maybe it's just some quantum entanglement between the two ah, of us, and we okay. happen to, you know, meet. <laughs> okay, but I don't know. Make Could it be. Up. I'm pretty sure that's how it was in Ant Man. <laughs> what are the similarities between entangled photons and entangled electrons? Like, how do you entangle photons? Uh, great. Yeah. So uh, photons don't have. They're not. They have internal states, just like a spin is an internal state of an electron. If I have an electron in one position, it can have two states. A photon also has internal states there, the photon polarization or helicity. Uh, a photon can be a right-handed or a left-handed photon. Uh, so an entangled photon is a soup, would, you'd have to, have to have entanglement, you have to have at least two particles. I could have two photons, maybe propagating opposite, opposite directions, where uh, if this one is left polarized, this one is right. 
And if this one is right polarized, this one is left, and it's a superposition of those two things. Okay. I guess you need the mic. Thank you. Could there be any connection between friction and uh, move, moving spin, heat transport? Friction? Yeah. Uh, um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think that's a question that could be answered at lots of different levels. Um, so there's a phenomena which is somewhat studied in, uh, in physics labs, which is called drag. Um, uh, what, uh, usually this is not, not studied in a way that really directly relates to spin, but I think there's a version with spin. So what, what is done in a drag measurement is uh, you have two very, let's say, two-dimensional metallic systems like Jen was talking about. They're two very thin metals. They're nearby one another, but they're not electrically contacted. Uh, and then you uh, you apply a voltage to one layer and not the other. So a current flows into one layer. And then you ask if a current flows in the other layer. And uh, it can happen because there's a kind of friction due to the interaction of the electrons in one layer with the electrons in the other layer. Uh, that's called drag. Um, and uh, you can at least imagine magnetic analogs of that that occur because the spins interact between the, the two layers. Um, I don't know whether it's actually ever been measured. Um, in general, you know, there are electronic origins of friction, for sure. Uh, um, and uh, that, that is something that is interesting, probably complicated. Um, if you're asking about friction in the sense of dissipation, how kind of these motions relate to, uh, to generation of, of uh, heat, like, you know, I, probably in high school, do you teach about like uh, uh, IV heating in a, in a circuit? No? Okay, maybe do this. It's not probably some, or first year college, this is class, you might do this. Uh, you know, in a, in a wire, if you're running a current, uh, if there's both a current and a voltage, it has some resistance, it generates heat. Um, and uh, so uh, that's, of course, Microscopically, that's a motion of electron charges, flow of electrons. You can ask, is there a similar thing for flow of spins? Yeah, and, and there is, but one of the appeals of using spins is that there's a lot less. <laughs> okay. Maybe even zero in these special situations with these edge channels, et cetera. Yeah. Any final questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, then thanks. Thank you. And I think that's the end of our scheduled agenda for today. So maybe feel free to hang out and chat with each other or ask some of us questions. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.